everyone and welcome back to What a Barb, a Pollen podcast. I'm Ops and as always I'm joined by the lovely Lecky Beans of Veg as we finally, and we actually mean it this time I promise, <laughs> as we finally finish our rewatch of season two, episode eight. Hello everyone, <laughs> how are you doing? Are you excited to finally get this done with? Oh <laughs> yeah, thrilled. I love that we have th- three episodes for the finale. <sighs> it doesn't bode well for season three, is all I'm saying. <laughs> oh god. It doesn't, that's concerning. We're having internal meetings about this very issue yeah someone <laughs> messaged like are you guys going to be re-watching season three and i was like yeah, yes we are <laughs> i will say as a general warning right now for the listeners we'll probably have to like edit some things down yeah. i know there's going to be people that are like oh my god i really want you to cover this i really want you to cover this for our sanity <laughs> for time's <laughs> sake we will do our best we're recording this introduction separate to the actual rewatch but we did part one of the rewatch separately and that was two hours hours i think yeah Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then episode eight part two was two Two and and a half half. it was really long yeah so in a minute when we cut to the episode and we sound very very tired and not all all pepped up like we are now (laughs) that's the reason why (laughs) look at us now like we're in like a post-strike world i know refreshed rejuvenated oh promo could drop at any time it's quite scary now don't you think god yeah it it does make me nervous we did try to time this that we would be done with our rewatch in time for you know any content obviously Mm -hmm the premiere or anything but the potential of receiving anything just kind of makes me nervous i know oh my god i don't know what i'm gonna do when we finally get something i'm gonna be like frozen (laughs) in the words of beans i'm gonna shit my pants my trust is within nicola i think that nicola if she knows that something's going to drop she'll warn us because i always think back to when the production video dropped last Mm -hmm. july Mm -hmm. she prefaced that in the morning by posting that lilac blank story oh Oh, yeah that's right and my trust is that if she knows something's gonna drop give us a warning sign yeah nick please so that we can mentally emotionally prepare we can bunker down so that is our plea before we jump into things Mm -hmm. (laughs) stealing your entire hostess for the most are you taking over (laughs) yeah (laughs) <laughs> what do you think we're gonna get first i think we're gonna get poster first i think we're gonna get the like cover for oh, season three not to be a negative nancy but poster's boring i want a clip are you joking a clip. i'm so excited for the poster okay if i could just put on my clown nose for a second i think we would get a clip because i think that we were supposed to get a clip at to doom mm-hmm. before the strike and everything happened so i think we're yeah. gonna get whatever that clip is or a date we're not gonna get a date we're just they're gonna start shifting things over on social media too like like season three stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I think that's what's going to happen first. I think the first thing we're going to get is a date. Not maybe a date, but a year. <laughs> Not a date, but a year. 2027. <laughs> a decade. A millennia. <laughs> My prediction is that we're going to get, I think like you said, it's going to change over on social media. Yeah. But maybe not any photos of Penn and Colin. I think it's going to change into like a different aesthetic. And I think we're going to get like mm. an Instagram post and it's going to have, I don't know, like flowers on it or something. And it's oh. just to say 2024. Like a lilac bee yeah i don't think we're gonna get any actual photos or content i think the first thing is just gonna be and you know what year believe me that has been a hard thing to find these days so i'll settle for that (laughs) the second question then to bounce off of beans when do you think we're gonna get something because it could drop at any moment december 25th december 25th you going christmas day yeah no i don't want to put my faith in christmas day again because the dark (laughs) sex plot last time was so traumatizing so i'll say early next year yeah but you know if i get anything sooner than that i'd be very excited chris Christmas New Year's last year was deeply, deeply traumatic. Yeah. But for fans who do want to clown on Christmas Day, there will be a support line available on the subreddit. There'll be a live chat as there is every year. You might see me there. Yeah, you can come and clown. Maybe we'll get something. Who knows? Yeah. Clowning all the way home. For real. <laughs> all that said, Lecky, can you take us through the breaking crumbs of the mini week? Yeah, so our mini crumb. It's a good crumb. It's a very good crumb. A company called Happy Planner has done a collaboration with Bridgerton. There is a Bridgerton B Happy Box, which seems to be a planner kit with all sorts of cute stuff in it. But it's a collaboration with Shondaland. It's available November 16th if you want to look at it. However, there's some very interesting imagery and language used in this particular little kit that we thought we'd (laughs) talk about and that we've been spiraling about over on the subreddit and on Discord for the last couple of days. So, Lecky, take me through 
through it. What are we seeing? Okay, let's talk about some of the great imagery here. So mm-hmm. we've got the traditional Bridgerton bees. We have the Featherington crest. We have butterflies, your typical things there. But there's also lots of mirrors, mm-hmm. which we know is kind of a hit for pollen season and that Nick has indicated is probably going to end up in the show, the mirror scene. There are hand mirrors inside the envelopes, but there's mm-hmm. a pad of sticky notes. <laughs> Can you also believe that a breaking crumb for us is talking about sticky notes? This is how far <laughs> we've fallen. Just go with it. But there's a sticky note pad of a, this beautiful mm-hmm. ornate bigger mirror that's adorned with flowers. It's interestingly adorned with the crown. But <laughs> mm-hmm. what else is on that mirror like? Traumatically a bow. <laughs> oh, we can never escape. <laughs> we haven't left the bows completely behind. We have to honour the past a step to our future, don't we? There's also a lot of crowns. It's the same crown that is pictured on Queen Charlotte's carriage, which obviously yeah. could just be a Bridgerton tie-in, or it could be hinting at the significance Queen Charlotte will play in pollen season. In addition to that, we have tulips, which we know represent passion. And then more interestingly, in addition to diamonds, there are emeralds. And we've kind of speculated earlier that there, there might be some significance to emeralds or an emerald of the season type concept. This is the one theory that we've talked about that I actually believe in. We say a lot of theories that are never going to come true, but I actually really believe in the emerald. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Golda, for the crumb. Yes. So if you remember, Golda promoting Queen Charlotte, she let it slip that there might be a new name for the special debutante of the season. Instead of the diamond of the season, there might be a new term, a new phrase used in season three. So we kind of latched on to the emerald idea. There's some emeralds in this box. It's kind of suspicious. Mm-hmm. On top of that, there are swans. We talked about swans in the Feeding the Ducks episode <laughs> about how Penn is kind of, a, you know, the swan that Colin has yet to notice. Mm-hmm. There's some interesting wording throughout this kit as well. And on one of the mirrors, there is the phrase, be daring, my darling. The word daring is actually used multiple times, but this phrase, be daring, my darling shows up at least twice in the kit. I think the third one is actually somebody may have written it out, mm-hmm. but it just seems like something that Colin might say to Penelope potentially. Quite a few fans on the subreddit have tied it into the line he says in Romance of Mr. Bridgerton. He says, bravery, my sweet. It does have that vibe, doesn't it? But I think it has more of a show Colin. I think that is the sentiment. It does. In a show Colin way. Alternatively, I've seen theories that it could be something that maybe Portia says to Penn or Violet says to Colin. I could see Violet because she's used the word darling in the series, I believe. Yeah, she's far more affectionate. Yeah, so it could be a Violet line, but if it's Colin, if it's Luke delivering the line, be daring, my darling, I will I will just die. So just to go through some of the other wording and phrases and stickers in this kit, there is the phrase, all my love, which appears in one of Colin's letters to Penelope and Romancy Mr. Bridgerton. There's also focus on finding your wings. Mm-hmm. Flowers need time to bloom, so do you. That one's interesting because I feel like in Queen Charlotte, there's a lot of <laughs> similar metaphors. There is. And if you remember back to this season three announcement, there was going to be Penn and Collins. Yes. So in the announcement, they say, with Penelope's days as a wallflower wearing thin, will she finally take bloom? And Mm. in the caption for that post, they say, Miss Penelope Featherington cannot remain a wallflower forever as all plants thrive best in the sunlight. Yeah. And that that ties into the themes that the new showrunner Jess Brownell has said about both Penn and Collins stepping out of the shadows into the sunlight. Mm. Yes. And on that same topic, the word shine is throughout this entire kit. It's used many, many, many different times. It really reminds me of, if we think back to Tadum 2022, Nicola read the first Lady Whistledown of the season. Yes. In that, the language says, as this season begins, the question on everyone's minds is, of course, which newly minted debutante will shine the brightest? The crop this year appears yes. to be rather dazzling indeed. Yes. Unfortunately, not every young lady can attract the light. So this imagery of shine yes. and light is very interconnected. The idea of flowers and blooming and stepping into the light yes. out of the shadows and shining. Lots of phrases about shining, as well as the phrase ordinary everyday moments, which just yes. seems so pollen coded about them, you know, just Colin falling in love with Penelope slowly over time, realizing that all these moments have added up to this great love. There's a lot of phrasing that might just be throwaway lines. We're not saying that every single phrase is connected to season three, but there were particular lines like that one right. that really stands out. Yeah. The all my love really stands out. With the all my love, people are speculating that maybe that's a show Colin letter that he's written. How he signed off a letter potentially to Penelope at some point. Can you even imagine that level of unawareness? I think we need an intervention at that point. <laughs> Will we see a pollen letter in season three? Please. <laughs> For a comparison, some of the more general wording mm. used in this kit, there is the social season is upon us, yeah. dare to begin with that dare raising that we mentioned before, diamond of the ball, one happy day, and all is fair in love and war, which is a reference to season one. Mm-hmm. There's some suspicious imagery and phrasing used here that just kind of set off alarm bells in our mind and 
in the minds of many Pollen fans. If you want to spiral over it with us, please do so. But you have a specific reason as to why you think this might have originally been intended right. as a season three tie-in. Yes. So I'm convinced that the original release date was supposed to be in December, yeah. as we saw in the leaks from To Doom, and the timing of this box releasing on November 16th, just in time for Christmas, right before the show may have come out. It would be a month later. This is November 16th. The show would have aired on December 14th. And I feel like they just probably didn't want to wait until Christmas 2024 season yeah. to release this box. They already had kind of this deal in the works. Yeah. So that's what makes me suspicious that there's some season three little tidbits in here. So if people do want to buy the box, where can they get it? You can find it on Happy Planner. It is available on November 16th. They have an Instagram page and I believe they have a, a website as well. And we'll link both in our show notes. It's available in, in many different countries, including the United Kingdom. So it is a real crumb. It is a real piece of merchandise if you want to go get your hands on it. As for the spiraling, that's just as fans clinging on to anything <laughs> we can. But I think there is weight to this. Yeah, same. So it feels like a really good crumb. The best kind of crumb sender spiraling, right? <laughs> but I think that's everything for now. A quick note from the editor's room. We do actually have a few more last minute crumbs that have appeared just as we were finishing the episode. So Lecky, we thought we'd add them in here. Take us through what we've got. Another interview with Nicola Coughlin from To Doom has been making the rounds this week. That's To Doom 2023. The gift that keeps on giving. We don't have an exact translation of the questions Nicola was asked, so apologies. But it seems Nick was asked about Penelope's green dresses, whether there would be a time jump, and whether Eloise would be involved with Lady Whistledown. Obviously, Nick didn't give too much away, although she did say that Penn and Colin were kids in season one and two, but they are not kids anymore. Mm. More interestingly, we think there might also have been a question about the Lady Whistledown down Queen Charlotte plotline in season three, and Nicola gave a very interesting response, which makes us very suspicious. To delve into that a little more deeply, please let us know if you speak Indonesian so we can get a better translation. But it seemed as if she was being asked if Lady Whistledown will begin working with the Queen in some capacity, a theory I believe we've touched on in a few of our episodes. We will probably discuss this more in the future, but it's an exciting little potential crumb. But again, if you speak Indonesian, please get in contact. Definitely. In other news, Luke Newton attended the GQ Men of the Year Awards. In an interview with the magazine, Luke talked a little bit about Bridgerton, and he said that he didn't know a lot about the plans for promotion, saying it's easier to be kept in the dark, that way I don't get overexcited. We could do it with following that advice. He also discussed the support he has received from cast and crew, specifically stating when anxious, he's reached out to Jonathan Bailey, who has offered him really good advice. Luke also added that because the show is so family-focused, it really feels like that, and it's nice to have that support. Very cute. Mm -hmm. Jonathan Bailey also appeared on the Radio Andy show earlier this week, discussing his role in fellow travelers. During his interview, Jonathan was asked about Bridgerton, to which he said that he was excited about handing over the baton, but that will still be there, suggesting that Kate and Anthony may stick around for more seasons. Mm -hmm. When asked when we'd heard news about the show, Jonathan added, it could happen at any moment. You'll definitely get at least four weeks heads up. We've known for a while that we'd get at least a month's notice, but it's exciting to know a release could happen at any time, though I still think it's coming in spring. Sorry, Pollen fans. One of our favorite Pollen detectives, Romp Romance, has been back at it with the sleuthing, finding two new members of the cast for season three. Cecily Hope will be playing the recurring role of Miss Kenworthy. Interestingly, the director is listed as Trisha Brock, who we know will be directing episodes one and two. Mm -hmm. Romp Romance also shared that Andrea Valls will be playing the role of Ambrosia in season three. Fans have been spiraling over this particular character <laughs> with many theories about who she could be. There's a post on the Pollen subreddit if you want to go spiral with everyone else. <laughs> However, because she appears to be following Martin and Sim Hong Bay, as well as a few members of the Lord Squad. We love the Lord Squad. And her spotlight claims she starred alongside Luke Newton. I have a feeling she may appear in a scene in Will's bar. And for those who worried that she may be a potential love interest, fear not. She was directed by Tom Verica, who did the last two episodes, which seems too late to introduce a new love interest. Once again, thanks to Romp Romance for the excellent detective work. We salute you, Romp Romance. In other cast news, Chris Fulton attended the international premiere of Falling Into Place. We'll keep you updated when we learn more about the release. Mm -hmm. And in in crew news, Bridgerton intimacy coordinator Lizzie Talbot has been working on both the Mean Girls movie musical, which will be released in January, and American Horror Story season 12, which is out now. And finally, the film Saltburn has recently premiered, featuring costumes by Sophie Canale, who you might recognize as the season 2 costume designer on Bridgerton, some of my favorite costumes ever. And are you sure that's definitely for crumbs? <laughs> I hope so. No more last minute sprinkling across the path? If there is, we're not covering them. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies. Apologies. <laughs> kids the night is long shall we finally get to the fucking end of season two of bridgerton <laughs> <laughs> let's do it let's go penelope what's a recap penelope runs off absolutely distraught not your best night here pen 
disaster comes in threes and that's something Penelope has certainly learned in terms of lessons this night. She's lost Eloise, she's lost Colin, she's found out that Jack's a fraud and her family are in the shit yet again. Nicola has said that in terms of what hurt Penelope the most that night, it would go in order of Eloise the most, then Colin, and then her family. I think that makes sense. Does that make sense yeah. to you guys? That Eloise is the one that really, really cuts the most for her? As much as we're a Pollen podcast, I think we see that that's the relationship breakdown that... That hurts the most. Yeah. I think she it, she does Colin. But I think a part of Penelope was never really sure if they would end up together. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, he was a dream for her future. He was a fantasy for her. A tangible one and one that she wanted to become a reality. But we saw in season one how, just like book Penelope, a part of Pen was resigned to watching him end up with someone else. Yes. So I think that possibility was always in her mind. But I don't think that even in her, her wildest fantasies, sorry. Her wildest nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. I don't think she could ever have imagined a future where she'd end up without Eloise. And that night she loses both of them. She loses her dreams for the future and she's left only with herself brutal and that is where we leave her she stares out of her bedroom window trying to wipe away at her tears as a reminder as well Bridget and house is directly opposite Penelope's bedroom so as she's standing crying at the window that's what she's looking out across so is Eloise they're just staring at each other crying The fireworks are fireworking, Cantonese together. It's joyous for a lot of people, but not for our darling Pen. How about Colin? How is Colin ending up the season? What is Colin? <laughs> what what Colin? What a Colin? Colin has taken all of his friends over to Will's bar and declares that he is in Will's debt. And thanks to Colin, we see that Will has patrons in his bar. So what does this mean for season three? Will the bar serve as the backdrop for more scenes? Will Colin mm. repay this debt in a more significant way? Will we see the two men's friendship develop further? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well. but before I talk about the scene it's, what I like about it is how in this show everywhere is by horseback or by foot like it's slow moving but I love when they sort of show up somewhere quite quickly afterwards like I'm picturing Colin <laughs> he's had quite the night he's gone in he's confronted cousin Jack Arrington. he's danced with Penn he's gone outside he's bitched about Penn and then straight over he's gathered all his friends he said let's go to the bar I don't know how far away this bar is but he's off I like that you're focusing on the the distance of the bar like surely this should have taken him an hour to get yeah. there <laughs> well five has proven that he can teleport this episode yeah. so maybe he's just sharing the talent yeah that's true they all went there in the TARDIS oh there you go it is like a wham bam thank you ma'am for calling this episode though isn't it yeah busy night yeah, and Colin in the scene, he just proved that he is still genuine hero. Look, lucky I'm being nice about him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so proud of you. The character growth we've seen on Veg is the real story of this podcast. He didn't need to help Will. Like, with some other people he's helped, mm-hmm. you could argue, like, you know, saving Marina is because he fancied her or whatever. But same with Penn. But he had no real reason to, no big connection to Will. Like, no big mm-hmm. friendship. It just shows that he's, like, a good guy. And I think we all yeah. want that relationship to maybe develop a bit more in season three and martin among has said that he's really excited for will's storyline in season three and for his family so a possible connection yeah. with colin we hope so and he has been there since the first block of filming yeah there yeah. you go he has mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. a good point crumbs queen beans oh, i will say it's quite funny that i agree it this really proves that a he is a really genuinely good guy and b when he feels like he's wronged someone he will do whatever he can yes. to make it up to him which is why he does this to will he he apologizes and he thanks him for helping him yeah. Yes, exactly. So Veg said that Colin didn't need to help, but he also didn't need to apologize. So this is a Colin who knows he has wronged someone and this is how he acts to make amends. He apologizes mm-hmm. and he tried to make amends by bringing patrons to Will's bar. And he does something publicly, yeah. But what's mm-hmm. really funny to me about this is the entire point of the horror scene, the reason that Colin was going along with his friends in public and was engaging with laughing about Penn, part of the motivation is that he really, really wanted to get his friends on side so that they right. go with him to Will's. This is yep. the setup for the scene. He's laughing with them because he needs them to go with him so he can make amends to Will by bringing the patrons yep. to his bar. <laughs> so in his attempt to fix things with Will... <laughs> to thank him for helping defend the Featheringtons and yeah. He completely fucks up his relationship with Penelope. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So he's completely shot himself in the foot here. <laughs> he ends this on a real high. It's a real good moment for him and he's really proud of himself as well. In contrast to both Eloise and Benedict, which we'll see in a minute. However, the irony of this end for the season is that Colin doesn't realise he's completely fucked up and he's completely set himself up for failure in his own mm-hmm. season. So although Although it's a personal high for him, he's fallen pretty badly in our eyes and in Penn's eyes. But what about a resident artiste, Benedict Bridgeton? 
as we mentioned in our crumbs episode, Ben closes his little art toolkit and splays four fingers atop it, which seemed like an off gesture, <laughs> perhaps suggesting Ben's season will take place in season four. And one of our listeners in my library, highly recommend her videos, a lot of great theories in Bridgerton Easter eggs, yes. by the way. You can find her on TikTok and Instagram. But anyway, she pointed out that you can also mm-hmm. glimpse two little tubes of paint in Ben's toolkit as he closes it. And what colors are they? They're blue and yellow, which we know to be pollen's colors. Stop. That is such a cool little detail. I love it. But poor Ben, much like Pen, Pen Jen Ben, he's not ending the season too great either. What about our lovely Eloise? How is she closing out? So Eloise has gone home, as we said, and she's briefly watching the fireworks before doubling over and sobbing by the window, turning her back on the Featherington house. Happy bonfire night, Eloise. (laughs) We see also that she's surrounded by ripped up copies of Lady Whistledown. Poor Eloise. I feel so bad for her here. Despite her anger at Penelope, she is clearly very cut up about what's happened. Meanwhile, Penn chooses to write again, and for the first time, we hear Nicola voicing Lady Whistledown's words. Yeah, yes. this is Penn speaking here. So rather than the classic Julie Andrews, we have Penn. It's almost like the full arc of her relationship with Lady Whistledown has sort of come around. Mm-hmm. Her self-identity, I think they're almost one and the same now. And it's just a really interesting choice by the production. And I think we mentioned recently how Eloise is going to feel with Penn saying she's sworn off Lady Whistledown and then the first thing that Penn does is goes and writes another issue. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, it doesn't look good to her. She's not doing herself any favours, but her whole world has just fallen apart. Yeah. We did talk about this in the playlist episode. This is the moment where Julie Andrews is taken over by Nicola Coughlin's voice. And it's that merging or reshaping of Lady Whistledown. Penelope has nothing left. She's lost the two people she loved the most. She's back to being in her ship family where everything's fallen apart. And she turns into Lady Whistledown into a way that we haven't seen where she becomes her. And she says something really interesting in her final voiceover. Veg, what does she say? I know there will always be times when silence is necessary. And of course, times when it is not. Gentle reader, you thought I was silenced, Mm. but you thought wrong. And if there's one thing you should know by now, it is that this author cannot keep quiet for long. Because like we said last episode, Penn did give up Whistledown for Eloise, but she's turned to it because she's got nothing left. And she's choosing the criticism that was levelled at Penelope by Eloise, that she cannot stand up for herself in reality. Penelope is choosing to no longer be silent, which is going to tie directly into next season when she steps into the light. Mm -hmm. And the final few looks from Penelope, it's one of my favourite moments in the entire show where, we, we mentioned this in the playlist episode, where she was standing crying by the window and she turns and does what she knows what she can she keeps going it's such a striking encapsulation of her character where she's still hurting she's still feeling Mm -hmm. she's still loving she's still crying but she sits with her pen the one thing she knows she'll always have and she smiles at the end because she knows that what she has when she has nothing else is herself and her talent and her resolve and that is it there's a final bang of the music and that is where our season two ends we made it (laughs) wait a second (laughs) We're not quite done because we finally find ourselves in the epilogue that exists outside of time and space. (laughs) The timing of this epilogue does not really make sense for several reasons, but we love it anyway because it introduces us to Lilac Colin. First of all, let's see where we are in the epilogue. In a lovely nod to the other epilogue of Thy Can't Who Love Me, we found ourselves back at Aubrey Hall for another game of Pall Mall. I loved up Kate and Anthony tumble their way down to the playing field, adorably wrapped up in one another, as the rest of their siblings, well, most of them, I don't know where Fran has pissed <laughs> off to, wait for them so they can finally start their game of Pall Mall. We've got Benedict, Eloise, Daphne, baby Augie. Augie, Augie God knows Augie. where that other oi, mysterious oi, oi. second child of Daphne's from Queen Charlotte has gone. Maybe <laughs> she's hanging out with Fran. We've got Violet, Lady Danbury, and of course, Newton the dog. Even Edmund has decided to make an appearance in the gardens where he died in the form of a bee, <laughs> his murderer, buzzing around on the flowers. It's a lovely day. Aubrey Hall is looking simply splendid as exasperated Eloise complains at how long Cantony are taking to come down the stairs. Elle mentions that they've been away traveling for six months. So when exactly does this epilogue take place? And more importantly for us, how does that impact the season three timeline? Fucking hell. I'm going to say the super quick, lecky lecky, you know we spent a lot of time on this. I'm going to very quickly try and piece the timeline together. The only concrete date we have on the calendar is the Harmony Ball took place on the 25th of July, 1814. You can see the date on the dance cards. Kate was injured the next morning, unconscious for a week. Featherington Ball, 
early August. Do we know when Cantony married? No, we do not. They didn't need a special license in the end, so they probably chose to marry without one, which would have taken three weeks or so. I'm sure Anthony would have taken his time before going on his honeymoon to make sure that the duties for the estate were handed over responsibly. So let's say Kate and Anthony leave for their travels in early to mid-September. So if this epilogue takes place quite soon after they've returned home, it puts the epilogue at about March mm -hmm. at the best. So why the fuck is Colin there? He should still be travelling. If not, he should be on his way home. We can just see from the filming leaks and from the Tudum still actually now. Mm -hmm. He arrives back in town on the day of Fran's presentation. The presentations usually take place in early April. And we see from the filming leaks that he embraces his siblings as if he hasn't seen them in a long time. So there is no way that Lilac Colin should be here in March <laughs> when Pirate Colin is still sailing the high seas ready for his grand return in April. <laughs> shopping for charms. And if this scene is taking place in April, then he certainly doesn't match. So in conclusion, the timeline for the epilogue makes absolutely no sense whatsoever and for our collective sanity, we should file it away in a strange bubble timeline along with all of Daphne's pregnancies. <laughs> I hope that clears things up for you, Lecky. <laughs> but time definitely has passed, we can't deny it. Some people in the fandom are actually very distressed about this. <laughs> yeah. I see some people going mad trying to work it out. Yeah, just give it up. <laughs> We've tried to work it out. I think we just need to accept some things for what they are. Yeah. But time definitely has passed, as we can see from Colin himself, because Veg, for the last time in our rewatches, yes. how is he looking? Oh. Oh. Well, what an outfit for Colin. This is legend. Mm -hmm. So I will let Obs and Lecky and, well, anyone who wants to rave about it fully, but everyone is a big, big fan. Firstly, let's be respectful. Let's start with the boots. <laughs> this is Pirate Colin Light. Mm. <laughs> yeah, we love to see it. We love these boots. Proper knee-high brown leather. Oh, they're good, they're good, they're good, they're good. Yeah. His hair and sideburns are also a bit different in the epilogue here. A sneak peek, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's indicating some passage of time. <laughs> His hair's grown. <laughs> uh, but as I've said, best not to read too far into that. At the time this was made, they knew Colin would be season three and they probably wanted to distinguish his look a bit here, mm -hmm. but didn't have the exact styling choices planned out. So that will probably explain a bit why his epilogue look is different from season two, but it's not quite season three. And as we know, they are mm -hmm. generally quite protective of their lead looks. <laughs> so it would be unusual. Um, and focusing on the rest of the outfit... Da da da! It's Lilac Colin! <laughs> Lilac Colin! We love Lilac Colin. And Sophie Canali has said that they use lilacs to symbolise first love. So this is yet another clue that Colin were going to be series three. Lovely. Mm -hmm. So there it is. We've got the first love link. And it's just a great colour. We don't really see him in purple. So this is lovely. Are we going to see maybe deep purple next series? Exciting. <laughs> That's actually a funny story. Oh, God. <laughs> uh -oh. A crumb story. A crumb story. Remember <laughs> purple velvet Colin. We will oh, get yeah. him. I think his anniversary is coming up, so we'll commemorate him later. It is, yeah. Happy anniversary. Um, but yeah, we've got a lilac suit here, a lilac cravat, of course. Mm -hmm. And if you look carefully, his blue waistcoat is actually patterned with tiny tally yellow flowers. Oh. He loves yellow goods and services. R.I.P. baby blue Colin, I will always love you. But lilac Colin, you are resplendent. One of my all-time favourites. The slightly longer hair too, the sideburns. He's head to toe in first love. We love to see it. And the meaning of this particular look has also been the subject of much debate in the fandom. Because lilac represents first love, this likely means that Colin's first love is Penelope, which is a relief, reinforcing that his feelings for Marina weren't as deep, even if she hurt him deeply. You can also argue that Colin is either in love or well on his way to falling in love with Penelope in this scene if his costuming is anything to go by. And if he isn't in love yet, he's likely having feelings by this point, so I think we can confidently say that Colin probably does think about Pen during his travels, whether she writes to him or not, and mm -hmm. maybe that's why he decides to buy her certain charms <laughs> for a little charm necklace. Necklace wreathers. That may or may not exist. <laughs> Does Lilac Colin mean that he's in love here? Or should the question be, does he know he's in love? And of course, look what he's holding in his hand, the green mallet. Earlier this season, we saw how he played with the yellow mallet, but here he switched out of the green, a direct foreshadowing that season three was going to be Colin's. Does the change of mallet show that he's not only subconsciously thinking about Penn, but now he's thinking about 
being with Pen. It feels like the tiniest hint that he's possibly beginning to show some awareness of his feelings. Mm -hmm. The tiniest, tiniest bit. This is Colin, after all, we're speaking about. Mm -hmm. The box locked away deep within him, labelled feelings for Penelope, is doing its best to claw himself open. And I guess the question then becomes, is Colin now ready to begin that journey? I definitely think so, if the dialogue is anything to go by here. As he looks at his newlywed brother and sister-in-law, Colin actively tries to get the next game started by saying, perhaps we may begin playing, to which Benedict Mm -hmm. says, hoping to get your inevitable defeat over with, brother. Colin also gets the seemingly throwaway line, I presume that means the game has finally started then? Colin is, of course, talking about Paul Mm -hmm. Mall here, but for me, this just brings to mind Lady Whistledown's voiceover from 202, where she declares that the only competition that compels her attention is the game of courtship. I think this dialogue, combined with Colin's active attempts to kickstart the game, is a sign that Colin's finally ready to re-enter that world, ready for courtship, and Lady Whistledown is going to be paying close attention. As Benedict says, he is ready to get his defeat over with and finally find his love. Does Colin consciously know that? Maybe not fully yet, (laughs) but he is definitely a step closer. Yeah, for sure. And then we get a lovely cute moment for Cantony fans. We all love it where he boldly kisses his beautiful wife in front of all of his family publicly. It's a super cute moment and Colin has a lovely reaction to this too. He just looks sort of proud, happy. He loves love, doesn't he? Yes. This to me is also our final glimpse of matchmaker Colin until next season, that is. (laughs) But as Cantony canoodles openly in front of the rest of the family, we see Colin smiling and he like bangs his palm oil mallet against the ground in a way that just conveys satisfaction satisfaction to me. I think he's thinking, job well done here, (laughs) remembering the moment he shot their two balls into the thicket earlier in the season. Uh, Yeah, job well done, matchmaker Colin. Keep up the hard work. I have a feeling your skills are going to be called on again quite soon. Right. I agree, though. I love how Colin is in the scene. He seems really genuinely happy and almost quite centered within himself, which isn't something we've always been able to say for him over the last few seasons. Is this giving us an insight into the Colin that we're going to find at the beginning of season three? As a reminder, this episode was actually written by Jess Brownell, who is going to be the showrunner for season three. So that really explains why so much of this episode was helping to set up the next season of Penn and Colin. But it also makes me think that the Colin we see here is helping to set up his character and his outlook for 301. Yeah. This really light-hearted, playful Colin, yes. which is a painful contrast to the way we leave <laughs> Penelope earlier in the episode. She's not quite the same vibe. And as Lucky says, Colin taps his mallet twice into the ground, nods at Benedict and strides ahead of the other siblings out there ready to begin the next game. And with one last beautiful moment with Cantony, that really is our season two done. Oh, we did it, we did it, we did it. Well, Lucky, uh, do you want to take us through the whistle ups and the whistle downs? Um, Maybe we should start with the whistle down. So Penn and Eloise is falling out, obviously. I can forgive Colin for what he said because it's set up for his season, but the whole Penn Eloise drama is, as always, a bummer. Yeah, it's not not the greatest moment for either of them. What about, uh, do we have a whistle up for the episode? (laughs) In any other episode, I would honor the amazing pollen moments we had in this episode, except for, you know, the last bit. But I instead just want to thank everyone who has listened to the podcast and offered support and kind words. We appreciate it more than you know. Thank you for sticking through us throughout our rewatch, and we hope you'll continue to listen. But more than that, I'd like to thank, so I'm going to get a little sappy here for a second, the team behind Bridgerton, the writers, and Nick and Luke for their portrayal of Pollen, because together they created a love story and characters that we love so much that it brought us together. I, we would never have become friends without Pollen, and I will always be grateful to Bridgerton and Pollen for bringing these amazing women into my life, and I am honestly grateful and lucky Aww. to call you friends. Thank <laughs> I did think, I thought she was thanking us and then she thanked <laughs> the creators, but it's still cute. Yeah, it's still cute. I love y'all. <laughs> you know I don't have emotions, but if I did have emotions, I would be feeling them now. Show we, what's our bow rating for that episode? Mm. Right, more bows is worse, so, oh, it's pretty shit, wasn't was it? it? It was a bit... <laughs> Especially you know what? Their dance was beautiful. Their dance is beautiful. For sure. For me, I'm going to give this a two. And this is why. <laughs> because I feel like for Colin and for Pollen, mm-hmm. their relationship, the only scene that really matters is the one on the dance floor. Because the scene where he says those hurtful things about her, that's just setting up their season. That's just setting up their season, the conflict that they need to overcome. Yeah. But that's where we see that Colin is really starting to fall for her, that he's he's on board the pollen train with us so yeah he's on board it and then crashes it into the side of a mountain lucky yeah well they pick up the wreckage (laughs) 
there is a re- there is a recovery process but you know what that three seconds before he does it is absolutely glorious i'm telling you it's just set up like if it, yeah. they just needed an antony moment where he just puts his entire foot in his mouth shoves it as far down as he can go and then next season <laughs> he, he eats his words or his foot <laughs> he likes to eat i like the drama i'm here for the drama i'm gonna give it a three guys what i mean it has my favorite line the run of gemstone mines in georgia you know i love it yes nothing will be funnier than that also it's my yeah, favorite sure. it's been my flair for two years nearly i think we can like can appreciate the future potential and the world building of an episode and still hate the impact on pen and stuff so i am gonna rate this a nine i think oh. wow, this is not a nice episode what a nine. i mean this is a low point like you can't deny it <laughs> so listeners my job is in like data science and stuff and i'm gonna pull together a few graphs to see where <laughs> what we rated the best and worst and where we <laughs> argued the most like where the biggest divide was. difference was between our ratings I don't think Penn would rate this particularly highly what about you no, exactly and I love Penn um, I agree with Lucky I give it a 2 I like the drama oh. yay thank you Beans <laughs> all that said finally done it we finally made it season two is done episode eight is done we're in a post epilogue world how are we feeling what are your overall season two thoughts not just in terms of pollen it can be in terms of cantony their story we had enemies to lovers this year but what about the themes of the show because i feel like season two is totally very very different to season one yeah i loved season two yes cantony for me like i know we're a pollen podcast but cantony really got me like super into bridgeton i watched mm. series one and i liked it but yeah cantony was yeah. just like a whole other world it's- i do like cantony it's like a really good taming of the shrew Mm. adaptation especially early on in the season when there's a lot more Mm. humor to their interactions Mm. i love just like kate and antony sparring with each other that's super fun it has a lighter tone this season doesn't it season one was quite dark in many ways Mm -hmm. this is more colorful it's more vibrant it's lighter i like the falling in love before they get married yeah after (laughs) yeah i think that's a trope i prefer and i love an enemies to lovers you guys know i'm a simone ashley girl i love that woman she's so 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 (laughs) beautiful so talented and Jonathan Bailey had some insane moments yeah. this season Jonathan Bailey yeah, so good. so good yeah I think that the pacing was really well done for what we got it was really well done I loved the sibling dynamics from both the Sharmas and the Bridgertons mm-hmm. you know I loved the strife between like friends and yeah there were so many like themes of relationships and struggling through relationships and just really good acting all around from everybody and so I mm. think yeah I think that the cast really crew should be really proud of the work that they've done and I don't know I love family dynamics so I love all of the side plots and everything obviously yeah I think season two was a lot of fun and I'm really excited to see how those relationships continue in season three mm-hmm. I do find it interesting because season three is going to be like such a change for Bridgerton and writing in general because it's going to be the first season that we see like direct fallout from actions of the previous season Yes. So it's not going to yes. be the same as it was from season one to season two because I feel like some things were brushed off. Obviously, stuff was addressed like Daphne and Anthony when she was like, hey, I was in the same situation as you and I had to get married. But yeah. I feel like it wasn't like a direct fallout. It was just something that was addressed later. This is like we're literally picking up from the previous season. So it feels like season two and season three are going to be like sister seasons. Interconnected. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think that's going to set up for a huge change within the writing for Bridgerton itself because we mm-hmm. know, and we're going to talk about it in our Crumbs episodes, production I mean, that they are also setting up other characters that are going right. to have storylines in the future as well. Yeah. So I feel like it's just, it's a new change that's going to be happening with Bridgerton and I'm very excited to see how that's going to all play out. Yeah. yeah. So, season two for in general, we've obviously spent many, many hours breaking it all down in the podcast, but how do you feel overall for season two versus their season one storyline? They have a very different mm. story and they have a much closer dynamic, which is something I adore about yeah. the second season. Yes, exactly. You know, we have so much growth of them as individuals, but we also see their story, like Nicholas said, completely level up, mm-hmm. get much closer before it all burns down. It's just such a great setup. Yeah, and obviously Penelope reads way too much into their relationship this season yeah. but you can see the beginnings of Colin returning her feelings mm-hmm. and it just makes the entire season yeah. magical for a Pollen <laughs> fan to rewatch. Lecky, we know you love your whistle ups, we know you love your whistle downs what's everyone's whistle up and whistle down for the whole season? For me, probably my favourite sequence, 207, that whole stairway sequence, yeah. gorgeous yeah, it's perfect. Veggie, 
miss a look? Um, not one specific moment, but just every moment when Pen gets more confident in herself. Mm. Oh, yeah, that's slightly getting a little bit too far ahead of herself. Oh. She, sorry, Pen, but she's slowly stepping into herself yeah. a little bit more. There's a lot of growth from the first season. Beanlet, what are you thinking? I think for me, and I know it's going to be cliche, but I still really love the like purpose moments and then the moments where Colin is like... Our relationship has taken shape so naturally over the years. One could take it for granted. Yeah, for granted, yeah. Um, <laughs> also, you know, I really liked Benedict this season. I thought he was a lot of fun. I think he's going to be great next year. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and I'm I'm actually very excited for Benedict season two because Luke Thompson is just plays Benedict so well, and I feel like Benedict, he's just all over the place, so in his season, he's going to be, like, chaotic. yeah, so chaotic, mm. and I'm just so excited for it. There's so much being set up, and I think to bounce off of your point, Beans, it's what you were saying about the little moments with Colin saying things that he's completely unaware of. Yeah. This is a beat of a slow burn. Mm -hmm. is because we know the ending is happy eventually yeah. we appreciate those small moments mm -hmm. I think right. my whistle up is it's just the idea of the letters oh yeah. I'm so enamored with the whole of their storyline getting closer uh, I think that's such a sweet part of it please please just give us some more insight about the letters please let's rip the plaster off everyone's whistle down mine is the Beauty and the Beast scene every single time oh yeah 100%. <laughs> Veg, you whistle down. Basically every moment when Colin says something that he hasn't thought through. So purpose, oh, so I like purpose, but the lines in purpose where he creates issues for Pen. You do not count. Sure, you do not count. And what what are we calling the scene with the daisy dress? The staircase scene. scene. Yeah, staircase scene. Which I know is a whistle up for Lecky. That's your whistle down. Oh dear. Well, I was going to say my whistle downs are Kate almost dying. <laughs> <laughs> falling off a horse <laughs> and uh the bow scenes <laughs> too. oh i love that scene with all her bows no my poor girl <laughs> she looks so cute despite it i can't help it she's adorable and that dress is one of my favorite dresses it's so pretty it is a beautiful dress i do love the costuming i will always love yellow pen and baby blue colin but we're leaving both of them at a really interesting point. We talked about it in one of the many bloody episode rewatches <laughs> for this episode. But we have them in very contrasting places. We have Pen really hurt, but turning into her own talent and almost finding her voice at the end or beginning to find her voice right. as she takes over the narration, refusing to be silenced. But then we have that contrasting against Colin going away thinking he's completely saved the day, thinking his relationship with Pen has never been better. Mm -hmm. And he's been on a huge journey this season with his self-confidence. Yeah. He, something that he was really struggling with early on and helping Penelope and helping the Featheringtons is something that really brought him back yeah. in a way and that's propelled him to go off maybe that's propelled him to go traveling maybe that's propelled him in the off season mm -hmm. and so it's just we leaving them in such interesting places then pick up the pieces next season and Beans what you were saying earlier is really key isn't it this season it's not like season one where everything yes we had Anthony standing there being like I'm not gonna marry for love mm -hmm. but everything was almost packaged and contained within itself whereas here yeah. we have them spilling over so we've got Penelope still left completely resolved yeah. we've got colin and Penn's relationship in having taken a huge turn yeah. on the rocks on the rocks babe is a way to phrase it, it. is on the rocks <laughs> i think we passed being on the rocks the ship has sunk babe it's a shipwreck in the bottom of the sea scuba divers no. are on the way down there no. right now to survey the no, sea it's like it's stuck on a sandbar and it just you need the tide to come up and push it back into shore yeah it feels less like an anthology series and more like an actual series series you know yeah i want to see how kate adjusts into the bridgerton life that's another element that we've never seen before mm -hmm. we haven't seen the main couple stay on yeah, in the next that'll season, be fun. so that's going to be really interesting it's also interesting because we kind of touch on this in the episode but colin he goes away not knowing that any of this has really happened that he's done this to penelope yeah. all he remembers is the promise he made to her that he yeah. would always look after her so he's gonna come back in season three thinking like oh i've got a i've got to look after penelope i have my special little friend over here who i may or may not be in love with not knowing yeah. that he's completely shattered her yes we speculate that he won't remember what he said but do we think he's going to remember the promise and that the promise is going to be fueling a lot of his actions? Yes, yep, 100%. Because he said he'd look after her. That's probably why he agrees to help her, you know? Not just because he wants to remain in contact with her after yeah. the spies. He made a promise and he is a gentleman and a gentleman honors his promises. I feel like he only said it out loud because he was drunk, so it's something that he was clearly thinking about. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, kids, there we go. Season two, Ooh, done. Yeah. we've done it. <laughs> Very proud of us all. We didn't think we'd be in this place, but here we are. What a journey, honestly. What a journey. What a journey. So, as Lecky and I were saying last episode, plans going forward, 
We don't know fully yet because obviously we don't know when the season's going to come out, but we're committed to being here to the bitter end with all of you. We've made a promise and we will keep it. But having said that, we're going to have a break for a couple of weeks because we're really tired. And not release <laughs> on quite so consistent schedule. Yeah. Yes. But we will uh, try to fill the void as much as we can. Mm-hmm. We're determined to be here. We have a lot of episodes in the works. Yeah, we'll be doing regular episodes. We'll be still be here, but I think we're going to let the Americans go celebrate Thanksgiving. We're going to give you a break. Like he's going to have some sleep. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll be back with a new episode in a couple of weeks, I think. If in the meantime there is some breaking news, we will, of course, bring it to you. We yeah, will do an emergency episode. Knowing our luck, the one time that we're like, should we have a, should we yeah, have a break? Yeah, it's going to be the yeah, time it's gonna we're having have. a break. I can feel it, it coming, the one we're like, like... In which case, you're welcome, guys. We manifested this. <laughs> so if you also celebrate Thanksgiving, happy Thanksgiving. We will see you again very soon. Until we see you again, Lecky, where can everyone find us? You can find us at Whatabarb Pod on Instagram and TikTok and YouTube. Yay. And YouTube. And you can find lots and lots of lovely pollen fans at reddit.com forward slash r forward slash pollen Bridgeton. Bridgeton. And for the last time this social oh. season, Beans, can you see us out? Oh. <laughs> Das violin du 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 du